Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apletero, your host, and today's topic and title is Update on Ukraine and Taiwan. Uh, I would like to introduce my guest uh, here today, my co-host Jay Fidel, our special esteemed guest, Vicky Cayetano, and our other special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton. Thank you one and all for joining us on this important topic. And I'm gonna just go right out the shoot to you, Jay. Um, how important is Ukraine? How important is Taiwan to the United States' interests? And the second part of the question is, do you think Americans may understand that importance or not? Well, the question is whether Americans can walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think we have a, a fair proof uh, of late that the Americans cannot walk and chew gum at the same time. I got a, a, an email this morning from Tim Snyder, history professor at Yale, where he, he points this out, um, that we have simply forgotten Ukraine. Congress has forgotten Ukraine. And without the United States, Ukraine is in dire straits. Um, and, and we, in turn, are in dire straits because we need Ukraine to win that war. So if we turn our backs, if we abandon them, it's not only bad for them, it's bad for Europe and it's bad for us. As um, for, as for oh, go ahead. Well, I just want to tag right onto that comment. Um, can you enlighten the mega GOPs in this country why it's important that Ukraine win this conflict? Um, they don't seem to think so. I'm trying to do <laughs> that right think. now. Okay, go for it. Yeah. Well, um, because, you know, it's a representation of the liberal world order. It's a representation of the integrity and sovereignty of Europe. Um, it's a representation of a morality where one neighbor does not attack another neighbor, where one neighbor does not do war crimes against another neighbor, where one neighbor does not stop food shipments to the global south. Uh, and I could go on. He goes on. He gives you, you know, 10 reasons anyway. Uh, and I urge everybody to take a look at Tim Snyder's uh, uh, blog because it, it goes through this on a regular basis. He's very powerful. And he wrote it, he said. This is very interesting, Tim. He said for this particular blog, he wrote it for Congress. He wanted Congress to see this. Uh, and everyone should send, you know, this particular blog, um, of which there are many anyway, um, to uh, our senators and our congressmen, so they should be aware of why the United States uh, uh, must support Ukraine. Second part of your question had to do with Taiwan, and I totally agree. You know, uh, what happened is o Obama turned away from the Middle East and see what happened then um, and in his pivot to Asia. And, um, you know, that, that, was not, that was an incomplete pivot. And then it all got turned back again or mushed up in some way so that we weren't paying attention to Asia either. And now the result is uh, increasing threats by Xi Jinping for an attack um, on Taiwan. And those threats are growing louder all the time. And one of the, you know, one of the elements of those threats is the United States cannot really defend Taiwan. We don't have the strength. We don't have the will. We don't have the weapons, and we don't have Congress. Uh, and so, you know, it's a big problem that there are, you know, what, three hotspots in the world, and we seem to be locked up in some sort of isolationist mentality. Um, so they're all of great concern, Tim. Okay. Thank you, Jay. Hey, Vicki, uh, Jay just did a great job taking Tim Snyder's uh, points and, and describing the importance of Ukraine. and as far especially for Europe and the world. Um, how do you think we're doing, or how is Congress doing uh, with the funding of Ukraine? Um, we know that the changing the Speaker of the House has disrupted that. Um, I think our budget, our, our, our budget funding stops in nine days. Uh, the government could potentially shut down in nine days. Uh, what, do you, what do you think the status is of Ukraine funding right now in Congress? No, I don't have an answer to that. I think this new speaker uh, is somebody that not a lot of people really know about in terms of what his positions uh, are. So I think it's going to be interesting. You know, in fairness, I think one of the things that while I think most of the American public still support the war in Ukraine, 
uh, it doesn't help that it's gone radio silent with now the conflict in the Middle East that's you know diverting attention there. Uh, but also, I think, in fairness, there hasn't been a lot of uh, clarity or positive news in terms of understanding that Ukraine is uh, neutralizing at least the conflict or uh, winning the war. And so the question has to be asked is, how much of an appetite does the American public have to continually fund something without some kind of uh, uh, end, end in sight? You know? Yeah. I'm well, let me let me question. follow up on that point, because um, President Zelensky here this week had to get on the airways to um, retract something one of his top military officials said. And what he said was that you, Ukraine is in a stalemate. And uh, President Zelensky had to correct that perception because uh, perhaps the concern is that a stalemate equals frustration and frustration equals the uh, lack of funding. What are your thoughts about um, Americans' expectation and certainly Congress's expectation that the Ukraine military have uh, success after success on trying to repel Russia's invasion? Let me, let me add one thing that Zelensky said only yesterday or, or today. He said, don't be misled by these statements that we're winning. That's, that's, um, that's not exactly true either. Uh, and and I, uh, he felt that Congress um, was turning its back on this because he thought that, that uh, Ukraine was doing just fine. Don't be misled, is what he said. So would you say, Jay, that Congress would, would be more willing to fund the war? If they felt that there was a stalemate, or you know, the, this is, I think, the challenge we have. There's so much going on between Taiwan, Middle East, Ukraine, uh, and Congress itself. Uh, I think is in a mess without the right leadership and a strategy going forward. Uh, I think it's a very challenging time, and I'm not sure anybody knows what the hell is going on. You know, I, I, I'd like to answer that by saying it seems to me that it depends on whether you're at one end of the spectrum or the other. In other words, if you're winning big, everybody loves a winner. If you're losing big, everybody loves a loser. It's And so why? Because the press covers the raw meat. The press loves to cover when you're winning, and the press loves to cover when you're losing. The press doesn't cover it if it's a stalemate or when you're not winning and not losing. And, and regrettably, and we've talked about this so many times, and it's true fact, is the press dictates public opinion. And in this case, the press has turned its back on Ukraine for whatever reason, raw meat or no raw meat, and now nobody cares. But I'd like to, I'd like to answer one more part of your question, Vicky. I, I, I was going to draw a chart for you guys, okay? Imagine this, this virtual chart. At the top, you get Donald Trump, and he's telling Mike Johnson what to do. And Mike Johnson, in his new point of position, is telling the House what to do and what to fund. Trump is selling, is, don't forget for a minute that Trump owes Putin stuff. Don't know what it is. It's probably filthy stuff. He owes a, a duty of loyalty, which he demonstrates, you know, since he was first in office. Um, to Putin, and um, he has given Putin enormous space in so many ways, and and then he's telling Johnson, um, cool it on Ukraine, and Johnson makes what appears to be a completely irrational, unsupported dichotomy between Ukraine and Israel, even though they should both be funded. I suggest to you guys, and I'm interested in your view of, of the matter also, I suggest this is all about Trump. He wants to do Putin a favor. That's why Ukraine is getting split off from Israel. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Chuck, um, this kind of ties into a question I was going to ask down the line, but it's perfectly the right time. And that is, is Trump running this show? And is Trump directly responsible, although we don't see it directly, but is he directly responsible for uh, a lack of interest on the mega GOP and the regular GOP? to support Ukraine? 
Yes, but let me respond this way. I think there's a really, really important analogy, simile, that no one in the press has raised. They don't see. They have no vision. We have a visionless press, as well as too frequently a truthless press. But the analogy is to an extended family. Either Ukraine is part of our extended family, or they are not. There's no... They partly are and partly aren't. They're not a Calabash cousin. They're either in and warrant our protection and our alliance, or they don't. For the Republicans, because they have a completely individualized, amoral, completely irresponsible to anyone else, much less the society at large, much less any other people at large, because that's their perspective, that's their orientation. They are the ultimate zero-sum entity. They have relinquished anything that would resemble human values, human responsibility, and the ability to connect with and value people or serve people. There is none of that. They offer absolutely none of that. So do they have a Johnson? Do they have no Johnson? I leave that question for others. Okay. But well, let me let me add one point from Snyder's uh, blog this morning. Uh, he said Am Americans uh, seem to be enjoying a a sense of fatigue about Ukraine. I think he called it Ukraine fatigue. He says, but what what exactly is the fatigue all about? Because in fact, you know, we don't have troops on the ground. Uh, we have never done more than provide money and some weapons, not all the weapons that Zelensky and the Ukrainians have requested. We don't have that much already at stake. And yet, he says, we are fatigued. What's wrong with this picture? We'd be a lot more fatigued if we had boots on the ground. And Ukraine's, you know, taking up the job and fighting with the Russians avoids having American boots on the ground. Or for that matter, NATO boots on the ground. So what's all the fatigue about? I thought that was a very good point. Hey, Chuck, I want to go back to the topic or the discussion about stalemate and Jay's point about the media not covering something in the middle of like a stalemate. Um, take you back to the 1960s and 70s when um, the military officials and, and, and government officials, I'm um, thinking of um, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, and General Westmoreland, yep. where they ginned up the news stories about successes of the American army and the Vietnamese army, um, claiming victory after victory, and it was in the form of a body count, body but count. Uh, really right. um, wamboozling perhaps President Johnson and the American public. Um, do you think Ukraine could be falling into that same, that same trap? Um, like Zelensky said, hey, we're not necessarily winning this war. Yes, for two reasons. One, because we have clearly learned nothing from Vietnam. Absolutely nothing. I was just there for most of three and a half weeks. It's the most wonderful travel destination in the world because the people are incredibly kind, generous, welcoming, and hospitable beyond any I've ever seen anywhere. And Japan is a very close second, and there are some others. Laos is good, too, but Vietnam's out there by itself. Second, best food in the world. Third, the experiences, the places are the most truly memorable in the best possible ways that you will ever have. So I commend it. But I raise that because in Vietnam, there is no such thing as the Vietnam War. It's the American War. And the prior period is not called the French War. It's called the French equivalence of dependency, the dependency on French period, colonialism. Right? Prior to that was the Chinese domination for a thousand years. Okay, the Vietnamese have outlasted and driven out the Chinese, not militarily, although they won some, but in human ways, politically, psychologically, emotionally, socially. They have outlasted and defeated the French, also militarily, but also culturally. They outlasted the Americans, at the end of which, Ho Chi Minh's plan was unite, and I'm going to get back to Ukraine and how this fits in in a sec, but the plan was 
ally with the Americans and the Westerners in Europe and, and play China and Russia off against each other. Ho Chi Minh had the greatest vision of world balance that was relationship-based in a realistic and constructive way that any world leader has ever come up with. And unfortunately, he died. And the next guy, another old guy. You know, you want to know what stalemate is? Stalemate is an old spouse who has lost attractiveness and interest. That's what stalemate is. There's no upside to it. Only death is its product. No end, no reason for funding, but that's not what Ukraine is. It's not whether or what stalemate is, it's whether they deserve our relationship at the level right. that any well, Okay, the but getting to the that's question, do you think they, they could fall into the trap of what I would call the spin room, where either the United States is spinning success, whether it's realized or not, on the ground in Ukraine, or Ukraine starts to spin. Uh, the reports of successes that may not be apparent uh, on the ground in Ukraine. Are, could they fall in that same trap as Vietnam? I, I don't think that's the question. I think the question is, including can we learn enough from Vietnam to realize what the question is, are we willing to recognize that a long-term, lasting relationship, familial relationship, including protective measures with Ukraine, is an essential part of who we need to be. That's the question. Okay. Great. That it, you will never see in the press, you will never hear it raised by a politician, but ultimately, at a human level, that is the question. What well, is the relationship? Here on Think Tech what is so, thank you, you heard in Tim Snyder? All yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, Vicky, for you. Um, the United States, for the first time, is dir uh, directing military aid from the U.S. coffers, not, not a, any kind of military loan program um, or funding from some kind of loan program. We're, we're now directing direct help to Taiwan, and we are actually training their troops shortly, or have been. Uh, this seems to step up the game. Uh, is that the right direction for the United States to take, given our recognition of Taiwan as um, a one-China policy? Uh, or does that, does that antagonize China? Or is this a wise move for us to um, get, our, get our nose under the tent, so to speak, with uh, aiding Taiwan? And you talk know, about I... multiple compound questions. That's the granddaddy. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Vicky. Jay's actually right. So here's a question <laughs> synthesized and, and truncated. Is it a good idea to give direct military funding to Taiwan when there's a one China policy and we'd be um, kind of in opposition to that? So I, I hope that the, the uh, military leaders and the administration and Congress think about this in terms of what is the end game? What is it we want out? Because I believe that one of the things about the American people today is we're a rather self-centered society. If it doesn't affect us, we're not real concerned about what's happening in the rest of the world. But we've got to make sure that we understand the lessons from World War II. And back then, Americans didn't want to enter the war either, regardless of the fact that Britain was being bombed out completely. So we've got to understand that we are going to be impacted when this world order uh, goes into chaos and Russia and China are definitely interested in leading that charge. And I think that if Americans understand that, we will really have much more of the willpower to uh, an understanding to support the war in Ukraine because we understand what it means to us as a people, that it doesn't just end between Ukraine and Russia, that it goes on to other countries and to the United States. But I believe that's important. And then as far as for Taiwan, China wants to dominate. Taiwan is not going to be the end result, even though that's all they say, that that has been their, uh, you know, philosophy that, Ty that Taiwan belongs to China. It didn't end in Hong Kong. It's not going to end with Taiwan. It's going to be all of Asia. And I hope that the Americans understand that and aren't as short-sighted as I fear many of my own friends are like that, 
You know, how is it going to affect us? We need to concentrate on things that we've got to deal with. Very short-sighted, rather insular and isolationist policy that is going to uh, ultimately cost the United States in so many ways. And Vicky's yeah, exactly you. right. Look at the South China Sea. There is no question that China's actions and objectives are acquisitive far beyond Taiwan. They are already butting heads with Japan and Korea intentionally, frequently. They are getting increasingly aggressive with the Philippines and Vietnam and others who have some tendencies to try and stand up to them. But ultimately, I honestly believe that it comes down to see the relationship, make it the relationship that you need it to be in order to be the per person you need to be. If the U.S. is a person, and it's an extremely chaotic, internally conflicted, morally questionable person at this point in time, both domestically and internationally, if we are that person, what relationship with whom do we most need, can we most learn from to enable ourselves to be motivated to become and become better people? That's the question for the U.S. that I see. All of this, Ukraine, okay. Taiwan, mm -hmm. it all, the Mideast, it all fits into that question. I, I want to I wanna add something well, I, to that. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not just talking about a, a kinetic war where we have to train the Taiwanese to be more aggressive because they're, they're kind of complacent, you know. They think it'll all work out. not going to work out. Um, and the training may or may not help. But the fact is that China is involved in a non-kinetic, hybrid, um, asymmetric war all over the world, including this country. People don't realize the amount of hacking that's going on. They don't realize the amount of theft of international, or rather intellectual property that's going on. And it's not only in the U.S., it's elsewhere, too. China is fighting its war of dominance everywhere in the world. Everything it does is, is gauged to uh, increase that dominance. Now, let me add the same thing with Putin and Russia. Um, he, is, he is fighting a world of what, what recovering the USSR everywhere he can, including, uh, I might add, um, in the Israeli conflict, uh, including in Azerbaijan and its fight, its takeover of, of part of uh, uh, Armenia. Uh, which we didn't catch at all. To your point, Vicky, we are, we are not thinking globally. That is a serious problem down there, and it's very violent, and it's likely to blow up, and Russia is involved. Um, so, I mean, what, what you have is uh, the U.S. on the defensive, but the U.S. doesn't realize it's on the defensive. The U.S. as the world's policeman, you know, de facto, but the U.S. doesn't realize that it has burdens and responsibilities in that regard. So the average guy on Main Street or girl on Main Street USA doesn't have a clue about this. We have to protect the world order. And if we don't, we're going to have to put boots on the ground and many Americans will die. Okay, well, let me... Okay, the average American doesn't understand that, but they would understand... Uh, and as they did understand, when we had a semiconductor chip shortage, uh, they understood very quickly that they couldn't get their F-150s supplied with computer chips because there were none to be had. So if, if, if Taiwan is 64% uh, uh, responsible for all semi, semiconductor chip manufacturing, uh, isn't there an interest for China to be a part of that and, and, and control that? And that's the question. Is our interest... And I, I understand what uh, Chuck was saying about it should be based on relationship, but is our interest essentially focused on the continuation of semiconductor chip manufacturing? Jay, to you. Well, a couple of thoughts about that. Uh, everybody says, and I suppose it's true, that China wants Taiwan because of the, the Chinese Chip Corporation. Um, and in, in part, that may be true because the world more and more every day, every day that we wake up needs chips. For all of our consumer goods, everything, we need chips. On the other hand, remember that, uh, what is it, TMSC, TMSC, the chip manufacturer in Taiwan, um, they're building um, with American encouragement. I don't think the 
encouragement is adequate, but they're building a, a copycat facility somewhere in the West right now today. And it's a war uh, against time, because if, if that facility can be built and bigger and more mm, capable than the one in Taiwan, we don't have to worry so much. But if it can't, if it's incomplete at the day of the crunch, and I'm sure that China has a calendar also, um, then you know we're behind and we may never catch up. So <clears throat> bottom line is the answer to your question, Tim, is yes. Okay, great. Uh, Vicky, do you agree with that answer? Is our, our primary interest um, to ensure uh, TSMS, I think it is? Um, yes, MC. MC, yes, yes thank MC, you. Yes. Do you think that's our, the United States' primary interest for being involved over there? Or is it um, worried about global expansion of China and their ability to use um, you know, the South China Sea as the uh, free and you know ability to use their largest navy, uh, I and Taiwan seems both. to be in the way of that. I think it's both, and I think for the American public to understand that how the problem with the chip production, how that's going to affect our everyday lives, and basically put a chokehold on everything that we do. Uh, I'm afraid that sometimes we're very simplistic in our views, and we need to connect the dots uh, for the American public. And when you talk about having leadership in, you know, what is it, close to half of our population, uh, the Republicans still having Donald Trump as a front runner uh, for the Republican nomination, it's just amazing. It's, a, it's appalling because that is, that general, that person is the, is the most selfish individual you can ever think about. And that kind of messaging that American public buys into concerns me about what our people are, what Americans are all about now. We're not willing to make sacrifices to better our lives in the long term. We're really thinking short term, very insular, very much about what does it, how does it impact my life? So we need to connect the dots so that they understand how it will impact their lives and their children and grandchildren how to connect the dots to that. But I believe it's all of that you talked about, the chips, the economy, and of course, world dominance. Mm -hmm. Well, the other part will be a question to Chuck on expense. Uh, Chuck, this question is, with the recent uh, agreements with Australia, the Philippines, again, to get a, more of our bases established back in the Philippines, uh, most of them have been put out, taken out, like Subic Bay, things of that nature, and Japan. Um, this is going to cost money. Does, the, does Congress have a stomach for now an increasing budget uh, for Taiwan in addition to Israel, in addition to Ukraine? Well, I don't want to be a broken record stuck on the same brew, but unless and until we use that person analogy and determine which relationships which with which other people, countries, yeah. are the most essential for us to be the kind of person we can best be, the kind of country we can best be. What does that look like? What are the components of that? What are the trade-offs? What do we bring to the table? What do they, they bring to the table? What do we do best that we can share with them? What do they do best they can share with us? What can we learn from them? And if anything, they from until we start to do the really system design relationship building approach to our foreign relations. Well, what if, what if the Biden administration or, or the administration after Biden, whatever that would be, I don't think it's going to be Trump, but it's not. Um, what if they understand that point that you're making, yet we still have um, the, the, the House of Representatives controlled by the MAGA GOP? Uh, will they get that point? Uh, and if they don't get that point, are we are we in a stalemate? No, it, it doesn't matter whether they get the point or not, because if they don't get the point, the train will leave without them. But they have the vote. But they don't. They can't pass anything. They can't pass anything in the Senate. Their own minority leader opposes them on Ukraine. Okay. No, well, they Chuck, don't have the votes. They don't Chuck, have the votes. They, they have the illusion. You need votes. You need affirmative votes to take affirmative action. They You're cannot. talking about a stalemate where nobody takes action. 
We cannot afford to do that. Right. This is the person who is in a situation where they're in an amazingly diverse room, a room of amazingly diverse, wonderful people with whom relationships and learning are infinitely possible. And they're so internally conflicted that they cannot move forward on any single relationship. So that's my answer to your question. Okay, great. Uh, we've run out of time, so I get to go around the virtual table. And I'll start with you, Jay, uh, your final thoughts on Ukraine and or Taiwan, or both. I want to go to a point that uh, Chuck made a minute ago, or you, or both of you, about the quad, you know, in, in, the, in South Pacific. And one of the countries is the Philippines. And they have really stepped up. You know, they have been courageous in dealing with the Chinese. And they've been, you know, they took them to the uh, international court and won. And the Chinese on, on jurisdiction over the high seas, um, and the Chinese ignored that. But to keep on uh, responding to the Chinese provocations, and you got to give them credit for that. It wasn't like that before, but it's it's like that now. So this this fellow Marcos Marcos Jr. Uh, he's stepping up. But what what the show? We're having a show about this tomorrow with a representative of the security office in the Philippines. And what we're going to talk about is something that is relevant, but we haven't talked about it yet here today. And that is the attempts of these rogue countries, in this case, China, uh, to manipulate and undermine the governments of those countries that are opposed to them. And in this case, it's the Philippines. We're going to talk about what steps the Chinese have taken to undermine, to make political war within the Philippines. And I suggest to you, those, you know, talk about lessons over Vietnam, as Chuck mentioned, or lessons out of World War II that Vicky mentioned. We should be watching to see what the Chinese are doing in the Philippines, to see what they're doing here, um, because they're doing stuff here. And, and of course, uh, you know, Putin through Trump is doing stuff here. And, and I suggest to you that this remarkable, unbelievable division in our country and our government uh, that that makes it in, incapable, okay, uh, is because of social media being manipulated and other political manipulations that are organized in Beijing and Moscow. And uh, we can't forget that. I think that is happening right now and will continue to happen right through Election Day and beyond. Great final points, Jay. Thank you so much. Vicki, your final thoughts on the topic. So well said, Jay. I would just echo what uh, you just stated. I hope the American people understand the tremendous threat. I, I think unlike any other time since World War II in history for us as a country, uh, that we are threatened now. Uh, and uh, whether it's a combination of things, as you say, social media interference with our elections, uh, we really need to come together because World order does matter, and we don't want to live under an autocratic regime. And uh, that is being that is a, a serious, real threat to us now. And the fact that we can't get things done in Congress should not be the norm that people accept anymore. But we ought to be raising havoc over that because we, as a country, cannot move forward uh, if we don't resolve this issue in our own backyard. So I certainly hope that uh, we uh, are much more um, enlightened, learn from the lessons of history, and that the elections next year will produce a better uh, leadership that, that will take our country in the right direction. Here, here. You, yeah, great, great comment as well. Chuck, looks like you get the final word today. Jay and Vicky, both brilliant and incisive, agree 150%. And I'm also hearing that unless and until we really see our life, our choices as a nation, as groups and as individuals, as which relationship will we connect with, honor and value? to enable us to be the best possible people we can until that becomes our direction in not only foreign relations,
but domestic relations and actions and our relations with each other in the society, we will continue to go in directions that if we had seen this coming in the 1960s, we would have been, in a word, disheartened, brokenhearted. All right. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, we have run out of time, so I'd like to thank my esteemed guests, Vicki Cayetano and Chuck Crumpton. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us on American Issues Take One. I certainly want to thank my co-host, Jay Fidel, for taking time out of his day to keep this show afloat. And uh, I would like to say, join us next week on American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicella, and until then, aloha. Aloha.